for our wonderful speaker tonight, who is London Darcy, a two-year UT Grotto member and soon-to-be UT alumnus. She has not gotten to do as much caving as she would like to, as most of her time in the Grotto has been during COVID. Amen to that. Uh, but she loves researching the geology and physics behind the amazing stuff we see underground. Outside of caves and rocks, she enjoys video games, hanging out with her cat Juno, and discovering new thrift stores in Austin. London, would you like to take it away? Yeah, sure. So I'm going to keep my camera off because my internet's pretty bad and I don't want to lag out, but I will share what I have for y'all. Um, oh, presentation mode. So when I was pres when I was um, thinking about different topics to talk about, um, I figured it would be interesting to just kind of talk about some of Texas's geologic history and uh, just kind of from a more academic point of view, uh, what kind of what we see around us and why it is cool and interesting to me. So to kick us off, uh, I just kind of, and I'm, I'm going to try to not make this like a school lecture. I don't want this to be um, a drag, but uh, just feel free to jump in with any questions or anything, and I would love to chat. So to start us off, um, where do we start? So way back when, um, when the earth was formed so earth is about 4.6 billion years old and kind of where our story comes in um would be the formation of pangea so that's about 240 million years ago so um looking at the time scale that i threw in here uh we're going to be looking at starting in the precambrian -pre time and that's kind of the first rocks that we are able to see on the surface in texas so 600 million years ago our story starts and where can we see those rocks so we are starting out in the Precambrian era. So um, the rocks formed during the Precambrian era form the basement of these continents. Uh, the continents that we see today are, they kind of have, I guess you could call, it's called a craton and that's kind of the, that's kind of the heart and soul of each of the continents. That's kind of the, I guess, rock basement that forms these continents. And that is rocks that were formed during these during the Precambrian era. The place that we can see these rocks is in the Llano Uplift. And this is these are the only metamorphic geologic rocks that we can see at the surface in Texas. And it has a little red star there. So some of the rocks included in this is Enchanted Rock, which is a very large granite dome. And yeah, so we don't really see metamorphic rocks anywhere else in Texas because metamorphic rocks form in the, in the Earth's mantle due to all of the pressure and the movement and everything that the magma is doing down there. So when you think about it, those rocks can only show up on the surface if they've been uplifted or the surface has been eroded away enough to kind of get to what is a lot older down there. And we'll get to the story in a minute, but you'll see kind of why um, the rest of Texas is covered in different rocks, which is sedimentary rocks. So moving on. So why do we see the Llano uplift here? Um, so as I'm sure a lot of you are familiar, we have familiar with, we have the Balcones fault line that runs through the center of Texas. Um, if you look at the map that I have here, that would be this purple line that comes up um, right on this kind of southeast side of the Llano uplift. So this is a fault line running directly through Texas that over, again, millions of years and through various shifting events, um, it resulted in this granite being exposed. Um, the Balcones fault line being here is also responsible for features like the Edwards Aquifer that we rely on so heavily in Austin. Um, it's hard to pinpoint exactly um, maybe one, I guess, uplift event that caused the granite rocks to be visible there, but uh, over millions of years and just because of that fault zone being so prominent right there, um, we can see what we can see there. So if you look at the figures that I have on, oh my goodness, why is my cat freaking out? Okay, hello. So if we, if we look at the two figures that I put here, um, kind of moving past the Precambrian era and into the Ordovician period, so that's again a, lo a long time ago, but um, kind of moving, moving up in time. So we had two kind of periods of Texas being covered in ocean. So 
at the first side or on the first figure, we see that the ancient sea, um, it came in from the Northwest. So it deposited sediments up there um, and the, the south kind of Southeastern side was higher and mountainous. As we move up in the geologic time scale, however, this flipped and we now had the Gulf of Mexico is where all of this water was and the, sh the water would kind of, I guess, oscillate. So that, that's the word that we're going to use here is an oscillating shoreline. So the ocean would come up, deposit sediments all over Texas, and then recede, having depositing different sediments, having a different um, environment there, and different organisms were able to grow. Additionally, during these um, oscillating uh, recession events, uh, there was a lot of erosion, so that's why it says extensive erosion of limestones. Um, all of the, a lot of the, um, the rocks that were being formed during this time were limestones, and as, as the water would come back out, it would erode those. So we're going to get a little bit more into, I guess, the kind of scientific geologic evaluation of these limestones. Uh, I thought that this would be interesting because as we are the UT Grotto and as we're in Austin, uh, we can kind of see this at the surface the easiest. So I thought that it'd be cool to kind of give you all a geologic perspective of that. So as I said, um, Texas was covered in shallow oscillating seas that deposited and eroded sediments over millions of years. So these deposits, um, along with the various corals and other carbonaceous life forms that lived on the seafloor, um, these would grow, they would live there, and as they died, they would form, they would go on to form the limestone. And this limestone is the formational environment for caves, and that's why we have so many caves in this area is because um, Texas being covered in limestone, it made the perfect environment for it. So the best place to see um, kind of these, this oscillating sea bed is along Highway 360. So if you drive along Highway 360 and you see the gigantic um, cutouts on the side of the roads along the hills, uh, if you park on the side of the road and go stick your face up close to it, uh, you can see um, a lot of different organisms that some thrived in a deeper water environment. And so you can tell that during that time, the waters over Texas were very deep. And then you can see uh, as you move up in the layer, you can see the, the organisms change to be more shallow water life forms. So here are some of the geologic principles that we kind of stick to when we are evaluating um, evaluating these these limestones. So a big kind of the main big principle here is Steno's laws. So all of these make a lot of sense when you just kind of think about it for a second, but it is important to state them so so we know that it is a scientific method. So first off we have the principle of superposition. So obviously older beds are on the bottom, younger beds are on top. Uh, principles of original horizont horizontality meaning that sediments are deposited in flat horizontal layers. Uh, they're not going to be, um, yeah, so, so, so they're deposited in flat horizontal layers. And then the principle of original lateral continuity, and that just means that if we have a bed on, on one hill, we, we should be able to follow that bed and find it maybe in a diff, on a different hill. Um, basically, beds don't just disappear or appear in different places without reason. So, as we were talking about this oscillating shoreline, we can see this cycle of accumulation and erosion. So there is a base level that the shoreline would kind of return to its normal, but as the waters are high, we accumulate more, sed more sediments, and then as the waters recede, they erode. So as I mentioned earlier, different organisms thrive in different tidal environments, and as because this is um, limestones, which are made of carbonaceous life forms, when we say things such as different grain sizes or different sediments, a lot of the time we are just speaking of organisms that have died and they've become part of the rock itself. So we could be talking here about oysters, we could be talking about worms, uh, there's there's a lot of different um, different organisms that we can look at there. So yeah, so the, this um, graph on the bottom right shows 
again, this cycle of accumulation and erosion. So if we're looking kind of back at this cutout along Highways 360, we can see these different layers are being formed. So we have this exposure when the water was gone. Um, maybe at the at this layer, you'll see things such as mud cracks or uh, vegetation that grew there. Um, and these super super tidal and intertidal um, phases, we might see uh, organisms that thrive in a shallower environment. And then once we move down to subtidal, um, when the waters were high and very deep, we would see things such as oysters, like I mentioned earlier. So here's kind of an expanded picture of what I just mentioned. So here are all of these different organisms and different sedimentary features that we can see in each of these um, environments. So in again, as it's just kind of repeating what I just said. So yeah, in the sub super title, uh, we see things such as stroma sh stromatites and um, these desiccation cracks. That's this picture up here. Uh, as we move to um, more deeper environments, subtitle, that's when we get to things um, like bigger uh, reefs or again, such as big oyster reefs that might form. And these all again, the, yeah, so these all have to do with the different, um, not only the depths of the water, but the energy of the environment. So uh, things such as finer grains have a harder time settling in an environment that is very high energy. So we're not gonna see such uh, fine grain sandstones in an environment that has very high energy. We might see things like a um, an oyster mudstone, or I'm sorry, an oyster grainstone, which is just a bunch of oyster shells held together by like calcification that happened between them. But again, we're not gonna see finer grain materials. So there's a lot of conclusions that you can draw based on um, just kind of what you're seeing on these outcrops. And you can, again, make determinations about how deep the water was, how quickly it was moving in that time, and at what point of the cycle of that um, receding uh, shoreline that we were in. Alun, what do you mean by high and low energy in this case? Yeah, so um, high energy would be like maybe a riverbed that is flowing very fast and you're not, and yeah, so so high energy would be like a quickly flowing low riverbed. Low energy might be um, just a portion of the basin that doesn't really have a, a, a tide flowing through it or any currents flowing through it. It's just kind of standing water. So okay. that allows things like sands and muds to precipitate out of the water and settle on the base. Cool. So yeah, so, so that's, um, thank you for the question. Uh, so that's kind of the different energy environments that we could see there. So again, looking at um, kind of an, an outcrop along the side of 360, uh, we can see the different carbonaceous organisms that make up the different grains and thus the different grain sizes that form the limestone. So this has to do with another um, geologic principle called graded bedding. And this just says that um, if we see a decreasing grain size moving upwards, so coarser grains on the bottom moving and then fine grains on the top of a specific deposit, that means that um, th this deposit was made from a waning current. Uh, if we see the reverse, that means it, it would be from a waxing current. So um, each of these environments Again, we, we can make a lot of determinations about them based on uh, the organisms that we see there, um, the trace fossils, which would be things such as maybe a burrow left behind by a worm or um, a, an impression of a shell that was left. And then if we look at this uh, bottom right graph again, uh, we can see the increasing energy of the tidal zone. So different organisms prefer different tidal energies. Uh, so yeah, just, just based on what we see there. So moving out of that and into the um, late Paleozoic. So after 
Texas was covered in these shallow seas with the oscillating um, sea, sea line. Um, continental drift and collisions caused the settlements that had been gathering in this Ouachita belt to uplift into mountains. So as we can see here, um, this kind of higher central Texas platform with the San Marcos platform. So this is right about where Texas is. Um, this has the this barrier right here, uh, the Stewart City Reef. So that lines up right along with the this watch to fold belt and that kind of prevented further um, oscillations from co continuing to cover all of Texas and then recede. So that kind of, I guess, localized that to more Southeast Texas. So we can't actually see these mountains anymore um, in Texas, but they can be seen at various locations due to erosion. But those, but yeah, so those are some of Texas's ancient, ancient mountains that we have. So still being in the late Paleozoic, um, the rivers that were in Texas were flowing westward from the mountains to the seas to bring sediment to form deltas along an ever-changing coastline. So a lot of this, um, kind of starting at this green belt right here, a lot of these sediments were being brought down from the the upper, um, like rocky, newer Rocky Mountains that had formed, as well as uh, these West Texas mountains. So um, these broad marine shelves divided West Texas seas into several sub basins, or these deeper areas that received more settlements than accumulated on the limestone shelves. So as the rivers were moving through Texas, um, they were depositing sediments there the whole way there, and these basins that were kind of um, the, these limestone basins that were kind of protected from accumulating a ton of sediment in them, they went on to become our West Texas oil reserves because they were more of a protected um, location that weren't, wasn't being filled in with sediment. So. so yeah, that's why we have oil out in West Texas. And you can see uh, in this bottom right picture, again, more of just the sedimentary layers that have been deposited and deposited over time. So. Yeah. So moving up a little bit um, into the Mesozoic era. So Texas was at this point um, cover, still covered in seas in the bottom in the southeast area, but they were deeper and less oscillatory than the older ones. So these deeper seas allowed things such as the the chalky Austin Rock that we see, and then. Um, as again, as I mentioned, the formation of the Rocky Mountains to the Northwest prevented any more water coming, kind of coming in from that way. And as I said, it encouraged more, um, more rivers to form as sediments were being brought down from the Rocky Mountains and then all the way out into the Gulf of Mexico. So a lot of the sedimentary rocks that we see uh, along our rivers, those weren't Th those were brought in from the Rocky Mountains and then to be deposited down in South Texas. So the Rocky Mountains, um, just real quickly, uh, those were formed uh, because of the subduction zone between the North American and Pacific Plate. So the Rockies are actually extremely young mountains compared to a compared to something like the Appalachians or anything like. Uh, as I said on the last slide, we have the Ouachita Mountains in Texas, but those are, are very long gone and buried, and we still have the Rockies here today. So um, you, you can kind of think of that as far as scale. It's very hard to think of scale when you're thinking of geologic things because everything was just so long ago and over such a long time. But for something like the, the oscillating seas and kind of looking at these various limestone deposits, uh, you have to remember, like, that was over hundreds of millions of years that these things were being deposited. So it's it's pretty cool. I don't know. I think it's cool. Um, so then finally, we move into the late Cenozoic era, which what is what we would think of as the Ice Age. So as these rivers um, were being formed and, again, carrying these sediments down from the Rockies, and they were carving out canyons, and then the sea lot, the, the seashore was kind of starting to settle into its um, more modern day location. Uh, 
this was the perfect environment for large wildlife. So I was kind of, while I was researching for this presentation and kind of looking up what we had here, um, I fell in love with the giant armadillos. I think those guys look really cool. So we had giant armadillos down in Texas. So yeah, so, so over this period of 2 million years, there were four ice ages separated by warmer periods. Um, the climate and sea level changed drastically with each ice age, and the sea level was about 300 to 450 feet lower during cold periods. So if you look at this map that I have on the right-hand side, um, this kind of shows, the, yeah, so this is the Sigsbee and Escarpment, which is the, um, kind of this big flat shelf with a bunch of, again, limestone and what we call salt domes. So as the, the sea line was again going through its oscillating uh, recession periods, um, these salt domes were deposited and then under this salt that was being deposited, it allowed um, oil to collect and to be able to be accessed through um, under the, these, these giant salt domes. So it was being protected through that. So, oh, I just got a chat. Oh, nice. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so that's kind of all I had. I, I didn't prepare a super long presentation here, but um, if there's any questions, I, I would love to take some questions or I can go back and explain anything in further detail. Um, my, my travel to visit my parents messed up a little bit of what I planned for, but yeah. Questions, anybody? Questions, questions? Crash asked you in the chat, when did the caves start to form? So caves have been forming, ca caves are able to form as soon as limestone is present. So it might have taken, I, I can't give you an approximation, uh, but um, as long as, so as soon as this limestone that was in this area was able to be deposited, um, caves would have been allowed to form, especially as the sea level kept, as I mentioned, kept oscillating over this area and we had a lot of water um, going through the limestone and starting to carve out the caves. Uh, these, they could have been around for a very long time, so. Excellent. I have a question uh, for London. This is, yeah. is me and I'm calling in from Greece right now. So it's uh, oh, hi. four o'clock, but anyway, I appreciate your presentation. Just curious to know what your research at UT is about. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, so I am currently working with the uh, UT Institute for Geophysics. Uh, I'm working under Dr. Sean Gulick, and my research is currently looking at Schrodinger Crater on the moon to uh, do gravimetry research over that crater. So there was a, miss a satellite mission in 2012 called GRAIL, and it consisted of two satellites that were um, basically able to see as soon as they passed over um, maybe a more dense rock section, uh, the satellite would shift because of the greater gravity there, and it can measure, the other satellite could measure exactly how much it shifted. So when we take all of that data and compile all of it, we can see um, exactly how um, exactly how the gravity, I guess, varies over different uh, formations and such. So, for example, maybe this one granite that was outside of a crater zone has a different density and different characteristics than this granite that was inside the impact crater. So, it's my job to um, make this gravity anomaly I don't want to say anomaly because it's just how the gravity is, but kind of gravity anomaly map over the crater. And then I'm going to compare the data that I found there to um, some radar grams that were from a different satellite mission and kind of make a informed structure and geologic map of this crater that is being targeted for um, future lunar missions. I 
much deflection are you talking about? Like over the grating? Millimeter. Like it, it's not. It's barely anything. It's not some. Yeah. It's crazy. I wouldn't have thought you could even detect. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah. It's it's crazy. Um, if you're interested, there's there's another mission that did the same thing over Earth. It's called Grace. Uh, and grace is very important for, like, they can even detect, um, like, water table changes based on how the, the satellites change mm -hmm. over this, over, if you keep going over the same area and keep performing the same uh, calculations over the same area, you can see, again, things like, like the water table changing, which is really, really cool to me. <laughs> so... So yeah, that's that's kind of my interest in geology. Is I, I really want to do the planetary um, aspects and kind of marry marry the two because I like space. So yeah. Does anybody else have any other questions? Got a question, London. First off, very nice job. That was awesome. Thank uh, you. Secondly, uh, so. Not being from Texas, being a recent transplant, uh, I'd never really heard of the Ouachita Mountains. Um, mm -hmm. I know that there was a mountain range here and that it's <laughs> mostly. Um, based on the map you showed, I'm curious, I mean, is Texas Hill Country the super, super remnants of, you know, very eroded Ouachita Mountains? Or is that later uplift that created the, the Hill Country hills? Yeah, so... It's not quite the remnants of it. Um, if there were any in this area, it would be extremely buried. Um, the, the hills that we see here are all uh, of the limestone remnants that I was talking about. So those layers that were just deposited as the seas were, were coming in and out. Um, and then they went on to form hills because of the uh, continued or the, the erosion that went on to happen because of rivers coming through this area. So, um, so yeah, so all of the elevation back then would have been much, much higher, and then it was just brought down over the years by erosion. So the Washington Mountains are probably way under us. But I, I know you, I, while I was researching, researching, you can see them outcropped, I think somewhere kind of mid-southwest Texas, but otherwise they're, they're fairly buried or eroded away. Thanks. Yeah.